went to present there. Recording is on. Thank you. Um, but this year they've moved it kind of first they canceled it and now it looks like it's going to be online. So this is still just a, a preempt for that. So it's a little specific to graphics. Um, some of you may have used some of these programs. So what I've done is I've split it into first just an explanation of some of these programs core features that are of interest to that community. And then we're, I'll move into the specification for open raster itself, which they would already be familiar with. And then after that, there's a section where I would hope to have some responses where I'll describe some suggestions I've gathered from the community about potential improvements to the standard uh, and the drawbacks or the challenges that we have if we tried to push forward with those improvements. Okay. So uh, for those of you who have never used any kind of uh, relatively advanced graphics editor, uh, I, the stupidest example you could start with is like MS Paint, which everyone knows is notorious. Uh, you're clicking points, you're putting pixels on a canvas. We've gotten much better than that over time. Um, Photoshop is the most, probably the most popular proprietary option. And then on the open source side, we have uh, GIMP and Krita. What these programs effectively, the core feature is that you have a huge stack of like a, like hard, like folders on a hard drive. You have a stack of raster images like PNGs um, that you would be able to compose on top of each other from the bottom of the stack up. Um, you can hide things, you can move things uh, as groups or individually, you can blend things differently. So this is just a little screenshot on this slide from uh, GIMP editor, uh, where you have a heavily hierarchical kind of image with masks and a bunch of different features being used. And it's easy to add or remove or edit different parts of layers that are above others so that you don't have to go nitty gritty and try to just like uh, edit after everything is result. Uh, I guess you could think of it kind of as having the source code instead of uh, the final compiled program and trying to like go back and just effectively edit uh, one of these pieces. It's, it's very tedious if you only have the result instead of all the components it's made up of. Um, so Open Raster started as a way to represent this kind of tree structure format um, in a way that works with all of the open source editors. Um, there's more reasons for it, which I'll get into shortly, but that's that's the basic intent is to preserve this tree structure. Um, raster images are like what you're familiar with PNGs. There's also vectors, which are very popular for graphic design work. Anytime you want to have an image of many sizes, you maybe even for print publications or for different size icons, you would represent their image as a bunch of curves and shapes and lines uh, instead of those just rows of pixel data. Uh, so those are two kind of wide image formats that I'll be talking about in this. Uh, so interchange format here, I mean, it's, it's designed not to represent something specific to one program. So for example, in all these programs I've mentioned, GIMP, Krita, Photoshop, uh, Procreate, you have many specific features. They may want to really compress the files, save them as byte arrays or something um, that's specific to how their program likes to interpret the data that represents their image. But that's great for them, but then no one else can read it without doing a bunch of reverse engineering. So interchange formats are designed to have an open standard and to work with basic libraries for input output, like JSON, XML, uh, zip, various really universal, universally implemented standards that you have access to libraries for in a number of languages. Um, so the 
other examples of this, if you're not familiar with graphical uh, use of cases are like the ODT format, um, which is like Microsoft actually has ability to read and write these natively in even their proprietary Microsoft Word and Google online apps do. And of course, LibreOffice. Um, you, it, it's an open documented standard and it works and renders relatively well, you know, with in quotes there across all of these. Um, Media is, again, it's a source code for uh, music to a beat. Uh, you can open this even to show it in like a sheet music editor or in a music player. It's just the universal format. Um, again, as I said before, there's some compiled kind of files, like uh, STL is a funny example. If anyone here works with 3D printers, that that will let you have exactly what the 3D printer needs to do to produce the object. But there's no way to like back out and get the shapes that were originally merged to make the object you're printing. So that's just a funny example. PNG, you know, we talked about already, it's your stack of images and then you lose data about what was composited together to make them. Okay, so when we started to want to make a new standard for representing this hierarchical image data, there is, why would you make a new standard if there's already some great ones available? So around the time 2006, uh, these were some alternatives that were around. TIFF is mainly a print format. Um, it supports CMYK. It's very old, and there is a number of different actual versions of the standard. Uh, I learned from talking with some people that Photoshop actually uses one version of TIFF that's like kind of proprietary TIFF or something that can't even be read by other TIFF editors. So it's not a very well-defined standard to use, and it's more for multi-page rather than hierarchical layers. SVG defines the layer structure actually really well. It uses, uh, you know, XML, but it doesn't store any other data in the file. So the best you could do there, if you wanted to reverse to base raster on SVG, would be to use like base64 encoded data inside and make like one huge SVG file. And because some of the features didn't quite overlap, I'm sure they decided not to go that route. And then the big one, uh, PSD, was the main file used for this purpose for all of time up to now. Uh, basically, that's how I understand it, especially on the proprietary side. Um, Photoshop was one of the early programs that provided features similar to GIMP um, with the hierarchical structure. And so everyone just started trading PSD files around to use with Photoshop. And then when new players came into the game, from what I understand, they had to basically reverse engineer the standard and uh, that just took off. But it was never thought of by Adobe who created it as to be used in other programs. It was reverse engineered. So it's very complicated. It uses a lot of strange bit storage. Uh, some of the libraries I've tried to work with for it it has changed within months where they don't work with newer versions of Photoshop. So it's really not stable uh, for this purpose. And besides that, the major change that happened in 2006 where the open raster format was created was that Adobe specifically relicensed uh, the specification they released to be used only for developing programs in association with Adobe, basically. You can look at these links if you're interested. I'll send out these slides at the end so you can click the links actually. <laughs> um, right, so at this point, uh, we wanted a simpler standard to represent this kind of data to use with open source programs and to be ex accessible to developers of new programs and to maintainers of existing ones. So here is what the original spec is that they came up with. Um, it's currently supported in the two big ones, Skip and Krita. There's smaller ones, uh, MyPaint, uh, Draw Piles, like an online real-time collaboration program, a few others. And then basically all the proprietary ones uh, have no support. And I also thought it was interesting, the one at the bottom, Photopea. It's like a free Photoshop 
in JavaScript Hub. That developer is, they don't release open source. And so it's, I, I've tried to talk to them about implementing the standard and they're a little hesitant to that. So there seems to be a general lack of adoption. And some of the reason of, the, of that is because we don't have enough features to support everything that these programs can represent, which is why we're having this talk. So the actual spec itself, it's similar to like ODT and other open document formats where it's just a zip file. Um, the, the stack on the right is like the folder structure inside every zip file. So it's, it's very simple. It's just the data folder with all the raster data and PNG files. The stack.xml, which we'll go over in a second, which is like the, the main interesting part that actually describes what to do with all that data. And then thumbnails and merged image are pre-processed, um, meant to be previews. So like you could have, you could write a script for a Nemo or a Nautilus, which I'm sure is already existing to just reference these two files inside the zip to show a preview in your file manager. Okay, so the stack XML, it's XML is okay. I mean, it's better or worse you could have chosen. I don't have an issue with it, but it's uh, what there's libraries for this in every major programming language and it supports what I think we would need for the foreseeable future, or at least I'm sure the original developers of the specification thought that. Um, it's uh, one image element at the top and then quote unquote stacks, which are just like folders or groups or directories or however you think of it. And layers, which are the actual raster layers in this case. Um, they, ha they have to have names similar to how it would appear inside of the program, like on the small image. And the structure is just XML structure, it directly translates, works fine. Uh, opacity and source. Uh, so that seems to line up well with what we need. The attributes for the groups or the layers. XML, it, this is like very simple support. This is basically the extent of the support right now is uh, X and Y offsets, negative or positive name, uh, opacity, which if you're not familiar with graphics is like how much you can see through it. So the stack, well, we'll get to that in a second, but uh, visibility rendered or not source for the, for the layers inside the zip file and composite op. I don't put this image on the right here with the intent for you to read all of it, uh, but that is all of the current supported modes that are officially defined by the spec, which is one-to-one -one almost with W3C's uh, CSS3 blend mode specification. So it's a good starting point. Uh, it's definitely a shorter list than what some of these programs can support. And in addition, the four at the bottom that have a different compositing operator, um, that's also a subset of the Porter Duff modes, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, it's not all of them, even though the CSS spec does have all of them. That's what's missing. But all of the source over modes are one-to-one -one with W3C's web blend modes. Um, just for someone who's never you not familiar with composite or blend, I just drew up this really simple graphic. Um, upper and lower, meaning if you think of it as a, an art canvas, the upper is just painted on top of the lower. Source over the first one on the right side is the most familiar to everyone. So when you have like an X window system, everything there is rendered source over. In other words, if you move one window in front of another, the one on top always takes precedence. And if you happen to have any transparency in your window, uh, you get to see some of the lower one in a proportion to how much opacity you have. That's what was meant by opacity. So like the cross you see in the upper layer where it's black is an area of zero opacity. Uh, it's completely transparent. And then on the lower layer in the four corners, uh, there's the four kind of like L tetracy shapes. Those have zero opacity. 
Uh, so then in the lighten mode, the second on the right side, uh, it's still it's still source over compositing because you've stacked the upper on top of the lower. But where they intersect, there's a lighten mode, which just means it it will only make it make the purple lighter by however much white is in the the top, basically. So you can see on the lower on the lower right, it's kind of the yellow is perceptibly a lighter color so it's making the purple more toward white there and less much less so in the upper left um, again we're not going to go on all these i'm just trying to give a little idea of what we currently support based on and then compared to what we're going to have to maybe support in the future uh, and then the lowest one is very interesting commonly it's called a clip layer or a clip mask in these graphic programs it's basically, there's no blend, but the upper layer is only painted where the lower layer exists. So that's just one quote unquote composite mode. Um, you can imagine a bunch of these, like only the top, only the bottom, only where the top exists, only where the bottom exists, only where none exists. That's like an example of one of those. It's useful for not painting outside the lines, for example. Uh, We'll see an example of that soon. So that was basically the format. You have a, a zip file with raster data. You have one stack XML and a few preview images. It's very bare bones, I would say. It's supported by open source programs, but not really by proprietary programs. And there's a lot we can go forward from for here if we want to compete quote unquote, with the Photoshop standard, for example, because we need to have a reason to push for adoption if the, the other programs need to have as many features as they want to have. Uh, if there's no incentive to support an open standard if they're so limited that they can't, they feel like they can reverse engineer PSD better and keep up with that rather than conforming to a new standard. It makes sense. So. I've, this is just a list. You don't have to read these because we're going to go on to the slides for them. Of a bunch of suggestions I've compiled. Um, if anyone has any comment on what they feel seems reasonable or not, I know it's a new area for people here. Uh, this would be more for, for people more in the graphics department. But I'm open to anything, so please uh, yell it out if something sounds just weird or too abrasive or or not useful. There's at least one here that I could use some technical suggestions on to even propose an idea that seems feasible. But we'll get to that soon. It's interesting. Uh, okay. So uh, first, uh, since you just saw the the compositing operators, uh, the source over before, there's actually twelve of them. Uh, these were proposed by. Lucas film originally. Uh, they wrote a paper on it, I think, something like that. And in the official spec from before, we saw that there was only four of these supported, besides the plus, which is kind of it, kind of more of a blend than a composite. But I'll leave that. So, is the question would be, is there a need to expand when you could really just basically flip? the order of the two layers you would want to render to get a similar effect to supporting double these modes, uh, for example. Would anyone care to, to, to use a different named mode instead of just flipping layers? I can see it going either way. Uh, maybe you just want to say you have all of them just to say it. But right now, we only have a subset. The strange one that isn't supported with any kind of uh, and analog is the Zor in the lower right. Uh, I couldn't initially think of a use case. I'm, I, I'm not as much of, I do graphic design kind of on the side uh, for some web app projects, but I'm really more of a programmer day to day. So some people may be able to reach out more of if it's useful, but the original open raster spec didn't think this was a useful mode where you uh, you only have where 
neither or you know where they're they're not both existing you draw so that currently has no analog so if we put that in it would at least count for new functionality uh very this was one of the first things that i proposed uh is having both a composite and a blend mode on a single layer tag this is i've worked with a few graphic designers and artists where they've sent a photoshop file to me and it's used this they use it for shadows often um, where you would not want to paint outside the lines in this case like the little uh, credit emblem on the lower right um, but you want to have the shadow effect which in this case is multiply uh, instead of just darkening it there, there's you know there's 500 ways to do this in every program but this is a way some artists prefer so if we want to support that we would have to have both the source it, source atop and the multiply on one layer which is not in the spec currently um, the question about this, which is interesting, is that every program that I've worked with has kind of a different way they do the composite modes. So in GIMP, this is fine. You can, you can change a layer's composite mode independently of blend, and this would be fully supported. In Krita, only the source atop can be combined with blend. You can do a separate composite mode, you can do a separate blend mode, but you can only do this one type uh, at the same time. And then in, in another, like my paint, you can't do it at all. So this gets to be have the difficulty of designing a format like this. Uh, how do you choose where which programs you want to basically sacrifice getting the final result to be exactly the same uh, versus supporting more modes like what Photoshop does? um that's just a an, a trend with this so it's it's difficult so whenever okay. okay uh to make a misnomer out of the open raster name uh this is a huge deal for graphic designers or even just regular, just people like me who just want one file to use on their website, uh, you don't want raster images for everything. That's more for, for artists with a tablet and painters. Uh, you want rescalable vector layers, and so that so Photoshop certainly has this. Some some of the programs, uh, Krita supports it fully. GIMP only supports text, not regular shape vector layers and uh, some others don't support it at all. So the big question here is if we make, I, I put in like a, a merge request for Krita for this and there was widespread support. Everybody's like, sure, let's uh, let's merge this. They're like, no, we have to wait for the meeting because what do we do for programs who can't support it? Should we export both the SVG data um, which is how this would actually be implemented. You just, you just instead of having the raster layer PNG file, you just have a, an SVG file. Uh, so it's very simple in, in terms of how our structure is, but we shouldn't expect programs to support full vector editing capabilities if they just want to open an open raster file. So should we, should they just not render them at all? Should they get, should we have a copy of it? the vector layers as rasters or should we have for example uh read only capability you can render a, a vector if you want to be a, com a compliant program but you don't necessarily have to be able to edit the vector um so that there's a lot of options for that um certainly i think this is almost mandatory if if we're going to seriously use this standard as a replacement for PSD uh, as a big player. So, you know, it's an open question. Uh, I think most people on the Krita side, at least, are ready uh, for this. And 
but we don't want to too far outpace what we've agreed to support with other programs. Um, this is leading into another topic of non-destructive editing, which Photoshop has always been kind of a head in. That's one of the major selling points of that, which means that you can make something look different, but instantly turn it off. Uh, so the naive way to do this would be you make these uh, circles on top of the a little kind of pastel layer there, and you just copy it twice, like uh, the old pre git version control where you just make an entire backup of something for every version you want. But for anyone who's tried to program without Git that way, you know, that's kind of uh, tedious and a waste of space and bad for a number of reasons. So the same thing here, they've come up with the solution of you have the quote unquote mask. In this case, it's just affecting opacity, which is supported by all the programs I've worked with. And that means that you can turn it on and off and where you where the mask is like the little layer that's the white one with the circles. And where those are dark, you have 100% or 0% opacity. Like the white and black translates into 0.0, .0 to 1.0, which means fully transparent to fully opaque. And that can be edited separate from the actual image data, which is that green, purple kind of layer. If you did it without the mask and you tried to erase the circle there, you would never, unless you had the program open in an instance and you un, use the undo function, you would never be able to get back that gradient effect cleanly. You would have to remake it from scratch, basically. So that's what they avoid with the non-destructive editing. So this, this is fairly common supported. So I guess I don't need to necessarily, I haven't looked at every single program that uses open raster, but the ones I have, this shouldn't be a problem, but it's a new element uh, we can add. I would just similar questions to the vector layers. If there's no support, do we want to duplicate them anyway, just to support client programs that do not support masks or is that a requirement for compliance to the specification is that you support masks. So the, the more things you add on, the more difficult it is, and the less the images are gonna look the same across all programs. There's a few more of these getting more esoteric uh, as you go on, uh, where you don't affect the original rectangle in this case, you just give it a transformation, you hit it with a transformation matrix. Uh, and in this case, I've done like a little scaling and a little perspective. Uh, and again, that's can be just turned on and off at will. And you always have the original rectangle, you can paint on the rectangle, and you'll see it, it just paints on the perspective rectangle. Um, same question. Um, credit just uses a just put straight in the XML attribute. The, the matrix like uh, in CSV format. So that could be standardized, but uh, similar question. Um, from before we had the list of named blend modes and there's those are just made up by W3C. They're like the Lighten one you saw earlier. It's That's just basically taking a max of each channel, whichever one has more white in it, prefer that one. But you could imagine coming up with an infinite number of ways to take two RGBA values and mix them together, which some programs have gone very far with doing. Uh, so how many of these should we want to make universal and name? Should we stick with W3C's uh, CSS3 recommendation? Or should we try to make some of the more esoteric ones work in more programs by default? Okay, uh, this is 
this is probably the most interesting problem I've run into trying to trying to think about how to make this standard better. So like if anyone has any experience with something like this, uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting problem and I've talked with a number of free node and real life people and I've not come to a good conclusion yet. So this is a subset, but this this could apply for any kind of program you're trying to design a file format for. So basically I'm looking for a way to store a function that is safe to execute in a file, which is very non-trivial. In the first case for blending, which is more specific to open raster, it's a, a function that takes just two RGBA, uh, you know, a couple of floats, uh, eight floats, and gives one group of four floats as an output, and that's fixed. That's just for blending. And then in the generic filter or transformation, you take the entire canvas. Um, anyone who's messed around with filters on GIMP or something, like you can make supernovas and all sorts of funny stuff. They could just be any arbitrary algorithm with loops, uh, if dens, probably even random number libraries that you would need to generate your filters. Um, so this function in the file, if we were to do it, would have to contain, would have to safely execute um, a code on two, two canvases um, or or one canvas, depending on if it's a blend mode or just a filter. Um, so I've not come to a, to a good conclusion on this, but what I have found is at least for most of the traditional compiled C++ programs, uh, Lua looked like a reasonably easy to integrate language that you could load on the fly, even though your program is compiled. OpenCL is similar um, in, in that you can just externally call an OpenCL kernel file to run on in, in vectorized format, but that would only apply to the blend modes, uh, not, the, not the full canvas, any random algorithm kind of deal. And then TCL, uh, safe TCL, I don't have any experience with. Um, but some people kind of threw it out as a recommended language that would have less potential to just you load a file and it deletes everything on your hard drive or something. You know, certainly this, I haven't found anything that's both disrestrictive, but then this free in terms of designing an algorithm that you could run out of a file uh, that can come from anyone. So any suggestions relating to this uh, or if there's, if that's required, if Photoshop basically has a bunch of these filters that they can store inside PSD um, that work this way, um, but they're specific to Photoshop. So I don't, the external programs where you pass Photoshop files from one to another usually can't even use those um, algorithms anyway. But if we, if you want to save arbitrary filters without destroying the original layer data, uh, this is what you would need to, to come up with a safe way to execute a program from a file that can come from anywhere. So some kind of sandbox and yeah, non-trivial. Okay. Slightly easier problem. Um, if we want to support using files saved in open raster format for printing um, at shops that make physical media, all of them are used to CMYK. Um, otherwise, the images will come, I've heard, very dull. I'm not much of a print material person. I try to avoid using paper whenever possible, but I've heard you can't use RGB uh, regular PNG files like we'd pass around, it's easy to do. The print shops want CMYK. So they 
can convert uh, the the triple floats of uh, RGB into the four of CMYK. But every time that's done, it the rounding errors can cause the the original color to get corrupted over time. So that if the argument could be made that, that okay, they can just convert it once, or there can be a function in the client programs to convert it to CMYK once. That's fine, but then they can't make an edit to it then and save it back, or it'll slowly become degraded over time. So th we have to choose, we we'll potentially have to choose something besides a PNG file uh, to store the color data. Um, EXR is a super feature rich uh, thing. It's it's meant for way more than just CMYK, like, hey, but it does support that. But that's a lot of extra potential library code that would need to be included for a program to support saving that way. Um, so again, we can just save a PNG and possibly also an EXR, but then the more you're you're kind of inflating file formats when you do that. Um, I didn't put it here, but the .tiff format that we went over early and I said there was an open source kind of and a proprietary version of it, the open source well supports CMYK. It's usually the go-to file for that. But then you're, when you support TIFF inside, then it has like its own layers or pages a little bit more of a headache, but that might be a little more feasible if we want to have TIFFs inside it instead of the XRs. Uh, WebP is kind of just my own. I, I put that there. I don't think it's necessarily needed, but it would allow you to more easily render these files on the web because it's a little bit better compression. Um, it combines loss and lossless compression and just a slight speed improvements, but I don't think anyone besides me is really looking to use these on the web yet, so we can probably skip that. Yeah. Um, this so inside of all of the client programs, they usually have a way to specifically identify certain of those layer tags. Uh, inside so that when you move one from one place to another and edit it, uh, it contains the same, the same identifier. This is like useful if you save and load again, uh, and then you try to do undo, redo, or different kind of filters um, on the on the layers. You might want to know that you're charting the same one. Uh, so if we save that kind of unique value to the layer elements which is what these programs already do most of the time for their uh, program specific files like the KRA or the XCF, um, then it would be easier for this function to happen. And also for APIs, which I'm going to get to soon, uh, libraries, it's useful to uniquely identify uh, just to, so that you don't have to say this folder, the, you don't have to say the absolute path, basically. You can just directly identify a layer. Um, so that's just a little extra tag in the specification that would be required for all the layer elements. These last few uh, suggestions, uh, they're a little bit older. They took them off of the current suggestion list on openraster.org. So Animation is like, if you're going to do it in Krita or one of these raster editors, it's kind of tedious from what I've heard. Some some people can do this, but it's like you have to do frame by frame. They're not really meant for this. There's plenty of programs that are better. But for the few who who like to, like to do the extra work or like to use those programs specifically, there could theoretically be a use case for exporting a whole bunch of the stacks, basically. You'd have to have a stack and a merged image and a data folder for each frame, basically, of your animation. So that would get huge. Uh, 
Uh, but if there's interest in supporting it, similar to how it is in KRA files, uh, that's a point to discuss. Um, for SV, for, right, for uh, similar to how you would design a website, if we support SVG uh, for vector layers and people want to put have the font look the same uh, on all of the files that they export, uh, then you would have to embed the font files. If you don't want to just do the generic like monospace or serif or sans serif, that's on the host computer. Um, so similar problems you'd get there to web browsers if you don't do this. Uh, there's some licensing that they've gone over. I didn't. I didn't write this particular slide, so um, that's just something to consider. Licensing pages are the same as animation. Um, it's this would be more attractive to the print shop use case from before, um, where you may have multi-page uh, posters or pamphlets, and you would like to use this specification for that as well. It's better than TIFF in this case because you would still preserve the layer hierarchy um, and the pages, but it comes with the space inflation uh, since this would warrant just basically duplicating the trees uh, for all those. So, because this is this is meant to be a standard that's easy to adopt for developers of new programs, so it's not like super compressed like some of the more specific Adobe standards are. So you have to keep those things in mind. A very simple uh, feature suggestion here is just uh, instead of making a layer just to put the colors you plan to work with and you want to keep consistent through your project, you could have in the specification a an element probably in the same uh, same level as the image element at the very top of the stack that defines a palette, which is just every color that you would suggest people to use in the project should they open it. This, uh, this should be pretty easy because the programs, if they don't support it, it's, it doesn't matter that much. What's defined in the specification is just that if you read in the stack XML and there's something in there that you don't support, you just leave it as is when you export. So you're not overwriting features that you may not support. But here, because the image will render the same, whether or not you support a bullet doesn't matter. Um, and this is pretty self-explanatory, but the method of storage is certainly not this. I'm not even going to bother going too far into this for this conversation because every developer will probably have their own opinions. Um, but the, the question for that talk would have, would be, should we store states? Um, this is, there's, a, there's so many ways to do this. Um, that would be a big argument there, I assume, but. I'm fine that no one has has any has any argument here. Okay, uh, well, I hope the latter half of the talk wasn't wasn't too too boring for anyone. Um, basically, I'm just putting here that if you would like to use this either on the web or with Python. Uh, for graphics, you can check out some open source libraries that I've written as APIs for the current version of Open Raster. And you can look on the Krita uh, GitLab to check out some proposed merge requests for some of these features in the future. Um, if there's any other languages, uh, feel free to drop them and maybe I'll look into helping contribute to make those libraries as well. And uh, finally, we are having an online version of Libre Graphics on March 27th to 29th. So if you're still not completely bored by this or you have any suggestions, uh, 
for having an online meeting just like this all day those two days uh, feel free to drop and i'll probably be doing this talk again then with some more input thanks that's about an hour i guess yeah thanks paul i think that was more well the timer for the the recording was about 45 minutes oh okay yeah okay we started late that's why so we started late. what's your time what's your time slot is it an hour um i've they just decided to reopen the meeting uh but i'm really guessing there's going to be more arguments and stuff so an hour is not even going to be enough yeah yeah i think when you if you give this talk to people who are more familiar with it they they you will get a lot of cop a lot of comments about it i bet right but as long as you at least know that there's an alternative to psd that's being worked on then i've done my job here i guess so what what's your what's your background in this like what's your interest are you a are you a developer in some of this or are you have you done sort of graphic design or or what um yeah i'm i mean i'm interested in these programs and i do unrelated merge request to them from time to time um and i'm also i've made the two libraries here which are okay. directly related to this support um i'm all i have a separate project which i won't mention here but that would benefit also on the side if this standard was made better so they haven't worked on it too actively since 2006 so i was trying to bring up just spur some changes and they seemed like they were happy about that so yeah my, my actual job is more of a like a research programmer this is just something i do for fun mm -hmm. yeah it's not related to day work or anything like that CJ, you need you need to unmute yourself. No one can hear you. Thank you. So the the thing I found interesting about all that was how, as from a computer science perspective, you can think theoretically about all these features. But what's really interesting is what an artist would want or need um and and balancing the 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 possibilities between every possible g whiz computer science possibility that would bloat the standard with very little utility and but trying more incisively what does an artist need as a feature well, that, course, yeah the, that's the problem is that the psd as an interchange format covers different industries uh so between the print media developers or the people using the vector layers and the print is one facet and then the raster artists who would really benefit from the non-destructive layers or the non-destructive features that photoshop is very famous for that's like the other side so they Yes, there's different use cases. So I don't know if it's worth it making two different standards, but the, yeah, you're totally right. And, and you know, it seems to me that the artists may not yet have even really figured out what the right features are. There might be a G whiz um, feature that they've fallen in love with, but truth be told uh some more mundane or um, a different kind of trick might actually be more effective if only we would identify that develop it and then show people why it's better do you have an example of that no i'm i'm just uh speculating that you know i i don't use the GIMP very often, but I can imagine that certain things that you discover that this is easy and fun could be done better if we only could imagine how. Right. 
you know, but until you imagine how, you don't know. So it's. Yeah, that's why I try to make things as like generic as possible, which is harder. <laughs> and is it clear that generic is always going to give the right intuitiveness for an artist to produce the effects they're trying to? Well, the thought is more if they're using PSD and I don't know, for whatever reason, their friend can't afford it. So they download Krita uh, and they want to pass it to them. If they do that with the PSD file right now, it's going to look completely messed up, right? In general, uh, depending on how well they reverse engineer it. Um, yeah, so I don't, it's not there. Like they, their friend can explain to them how the filters or the layer masks work. Um, and it'll be, they just want, they just care that it loads the same on both. They don't really care how it works underneath, right? That's our fault problem. <laughs> well, that, that's just the interchangeability and intercompatibility issue.